I think that's a recipe right there for, for success. In general. Yeah. Seattle and came out there. He was part of that Northern White crew original. Exactly. And then one of them pulls out a badge. He goes, Paluzzi. Oh, yeah. This sort of famous moment which changed everything and made it right. We have a we have a poop turp. We have a poop turp. We have a I'm back talking with Adam Dunnigan, and today we are going to hear about how the American got hustled on Queen's Day. We'll talk about some of the early popular Amsterdam seed banks. We'll talk about being raided, and we'll talk about being robbed. Of course, we're going to be talking some of the hit strains from the time. We got Citral, Black Domina, Shiva Shanti, White Widow. Of course, we're going to be talking Sage, but we're also going to tell you the full story of how bubblegum came to Amsterdam. So let's get into it. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I won't, I won't waste the time. We'll just, uh, jump, <laughs> jump back into things here. But yeah. uh, we, we last left off, um, you had kind of covered your adventure on the way to Amsterdam, which involved missing a few boats, doing a few mm -hmm. sketchy things, but mm -hmm. all in all, you survived <laughs> and you arrived in the promised land, which to your surprise was true. And yes, you, exactly. You know, you, it really you, existed. <laughs> it really did. And, and you hit the ground running too. You know, you've always been a, a resourceful person and I've always viewed you as like a, you know, like the, the mad scientist entrepreneur because you come up with just these seemingly random, but awesome mm -hmm. ideas. And then you make them happen and leaves the rest of us going like, why didn't I fucking think of that? So yeah. I think that's a recipe right there for, for success in general is when you have the thing because I, I I see I'm on the receiving side of that many times too, where I'll see somebody and just like God damn it, that is a good idea, and it's so basic that it makes it's poetic at that point, right? Um, yeah, Amsterdam was again no internet, you know what I mean? We're pre-internet time, so uh, when I first got there, which was in September of '89, um, everybody was everybody when I first got there was talking about. Queen's Day, you know, it's like Queen. Were you here for Queen's Day? Have you been here for Queen's Day? Queen's Day. It just kept coming up over and over again. So I was like, "What is this Queen's Day you speak of?" You know what I mean? So like, I was pretty much like very determined to to be there for Queen's Day. And even though I was only there on the beginning for a short trip, uh, I was there for about about four weeks, four or five weeks the first time, and that was like enough to get the bug. But in those four or five weeks, every single person asked me the same fucking thing like have you here for queen's day so so having said that i basically uh planned my trip for queen's day uh and queen's day is basically the one day a year that you're allowed to sell anything you want on the streets right so everybody and and kind of you, you could play piano or you could play a violin you could do whatever you want and get money and not pay tax on it and then to the dutch that was like a dream right so it's one day they give you one day so everybody busts out all their stuff and they try to sell it and so i was there uh i so basically i went home just pretty much sold everything i had to turn around within six i got back in september and i was back in so came home end of september and packed everything up by so my ticket was for april um april 16th or 14th something like that like right before uh it was funny too because now looking back it's like oh i was even there for 420 without realizing it you know what i mean like i just happened to come in right before 420 but it was before 420 was a thing in my head but it was for, to be there a couple weeks before queen's day right so then I uh, scored some weed from the Homegrown Fantasy. I bought like, I think about two or three ounces, something like that. Like it was like pretty much just like, give me some small buds. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to roll joints, right? So my genius idea, because we're going to Holland, right? So I was like, I rolled a tulip joint for somebody and they never seen it before. And I was like, a Dutch guy was like, you've I was like, you've never seen a tulip joint? 
come on guys like tulip joint that's you're in holland this is the most basic fucking this should be the a no-brainer right so then i my my genius idea was to roll a plethora of these tulip joints of course in my mind i was going to get a dutch girl and she was going to dress up and she was going to do this and that you know what i mean but none of that happened of course so it was basically me an ounce of weed a couple ounces of weed got my friends over and I t taught them how to do it. And we basically made a little assembly line, right? So I made my own like cardboard tube sort of, uh, you know, like instead of to hit off of it, like I made my own, I just went out and got construction paper and I rolled them out. So we had different colors, you know, and cut the tops, made them even, uh, put a little filter at the bottom or whatever. If anybody out there doesn't know what a tulip joint is, it's basically two pieces of two, two rolling papers kind of together into makes a little sort of like a square. And then basically you put the weed inside of it, you tie it to the top, and then you flip it back over. And when you flip it back over, it's got the perfect shape that looks just like a tulip. I mean, it literally looks just like a fucking tulip. And so my marketing scheme, which is funny too, because I'm always like, I'm very much have always been about, um, a lot of puns right if you listen to my show you'll realize i'm uh, i'm, I'm quick on making my... up words combining yeah, quick... the words that I'm catches quick... on yeah i'm quick <laughs> on my feet when it comes to the com combination of words or wordplay or double speak or fucking you know double entendres that's like my 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 my, 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 my thing so basically it was uh wrap two lips around my two lips right and then i had uh a picture of that with some lips or whatever and then because i didn't have the chick to actually sell my stuff and market it i came up with this other idea which was i took a, a mannequin head and attached it to um to uh pvc pipe right so i had two pv i took a pvc pipe and then i put a connector to another pvc pipe and a connector to another PVC pipe. So I had this super duper long thing and I put a mannequin head on top of it with a joint. And I put like a, no, sorry, I put a big giant joint, like about, I don't know, like about a meter, like three feet long, like a three foot long fake joint. And I took a paint stirrer and I pierced the top of it with a paint stirrer, sort of like halfway down. And so I had this giant joint with a mannequin head on top of it. And I just kind of walked around with that thing and it said, tulip joints 10 10 guilders or whatever and i basically walked around and i swear to god i sold out within five minutes oh and wow I, and and i was like whoa man i'm a genius oh i'm such a fucking i'm so smart my my marketing is great everything is so smart and then some guy comes up to me and he goes hey uh you know they're just tearing those up and rolling them into small joints back there because I put it all I put pure weed in there, right? And I was charging people way too little. And the Dutch guys opened it up and rolled like ten regular joints out of it and then sold those regular joints for like five bucks each and just like quadrupled up on my shit, right? So I, wow. I thought I was I thought I was being all slick and smart, but I spent all night making those things or even more, like two days making them and marketing and making this sign. And then I, I should have just wholesaled it, right? I should have just went out there and said, Yeah, you wanna buy an ounce of Yeah. Triple up. Yeah. So I put a lot of effort into it, but uh and thought I was on top of the world, killed it. But in reality, it was just uh, uh, I was giving away the fucking farm as usual. You know, that was my that was my problem right there. You know, <laughs> yeah, you had a great idea, and it worked, and it was fantastic until you realized that they were what they were doing. So yeah, they, you know, they you got even... what you wanted out of it, but that I does did. make I, sense. I did, but I didn't get the, any satisfaction of having anybody light them up. I didn't even get to see one person, but I don't think light them up. And and I think one person did, but then after that, it was just like one Moroccan kid figured it out, sent his other friend up, said, give me, give me five, give me five. And I was like, whoa, five, 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 five. I'm sold out. Yes. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, Holland was like, that was the, but that was the energy of the time, right? It was like, kind of like, you could get away with selling joints on the streets, space cake on the streets, just for that day. I mean, not like every day, right. of course, but in general, it was really like, this is freedom. You know what I mean? I was like, in that mode in my mind i was 20 years old you know 21 at the time 2021 20, so 
to me, that was ultimate freedom. Actually, I was only like 19 to 20, so I wasn't even 21 at the time. So I could wow. go out and drink and I could sell, you know, smoke weed and fucking, I was just like, this is the greatest thing ever. And my, my rent, I think I told you guys on the, uh, before was like super duper cheap. I mean, my rent was only mm -hmm. like $90 a month. You know what I mean? So it was yeah. no, arg I couldn't argue with the fact like, this is where I'm going to be for the next who knows how long and it turned out to be 21 years in the long run but it was one of those things where you know uh the times that i was there which was 89 to 2010 i think were like probably the best years because before that it wasn't quite mature enough of a market it was still a little bit rough around the edges you know what i mean and then after that it just became like now you can go anywhere in the world and experience amsterdam in a better bit with better better weather and better food you know what i mean it's just it's 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 if, if you were looking for weed and uh you know a bunch of like techno or something then man, that's everywhere right so not not just <laughs> yeah. holland the one thing i haven't gotten down on is the pickled herring which is fine with me and we yeah. are going back this year and we do make a point for actually king's day now uh but yep. king's day is one of the wildest 29th. things we've experienced yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's very commercial right now. It's like big streets full of orange people dressed in orange and kind of like, it's gotten <laughs> a little ridiculous. And what really sucked about it is that they changed the original sort of uh, spirit of it, which was this whole free, free day, you know? And now it's like, if you want to be in a good spot, you got to get a permit. You know what I mean? And it was like, wait a minute, that was the exact opposite of what it was all about. It was all about the freedom, you know? Um, but yeah, it was, it was also uh, interesting too, because cannabis was still, like when I first got there, you could sell clones, like people were selling clones openly. And then slowly as the years rolled on, those things started to get cracked down on more and more. And you saw less and less of the uh, wide open, like uh, selling clones on the street or selling space cake or whatever they were doing, you know, loose joints like I was doing. Right. Well, is that, is that kind of when the seed banks emerged, though? I mean, I know they kind of started in like the mid 80s, but really the 90s, yeah. maybe when they kind of got consolidated down. Well, you know, when I first got there, um, the so Sensi Seeds had uh, had already opened up. They they had been in, in the in the dan in, uh, at their same shop that they have right now, which is in the red light. I think they moved there around 86 or seven, I think was when they first opened up. Um, and I got there in 89. So they'd already been around for a few years. Um, it was really being mismanaged already. It was like kind of funny because when I started working for them, which was in 90-ish, uh, it felt like they had already been in business for a long time. But looking back now, I'm like, no, they really only were there for about four or five years. But it, it because it was a stoner run company and really the main owners are from Rotterdam and Rotterdam and Amsterdam don't really mix. So they had hired some other couple like a german couple to run the place and they were like just letting their baby kind of crawl around everywhere and it was a little bit like just very unorganized mess and every drawer you opened up had like like it was like a junk drawer at your house where you just had like a wrench and a freaking mixed with others you know all sorts of mixtures of screws and end bits and drill bits and whatever and it was just like okay this is supposed to be this but it's not so when we first started there when I first started working there, I was really like, it kind of felt like a company that had been around for 20 years, but really it would only been about four or five. But then once I had my own company four or five years down, I realized you really accumulate a lot of crap when you're at a, when you own a company based in cannabis, you know what I mean? Like you just can't help it, but you're doing a lot of trade shows and a lot of this and a lot of that. And by the time you're done, you're, you got a whole room full of crap, you know, room full of lighting and all these equipment as as i look around and i'm like yep he's yeah. <laughs> describing, on there. My, describing the room <laughs> i'm sitting in right now exactly. <laughs> yeah you know and it was um it was also funny too because uh i got to work there at sensi during kind of like a weird period because we had the gulf war going on right it just started and that changed the vibe of the whole thing because when i first was there it was busy and everything was rolling and then the Gulf War started exactly when I was actually physically like working there. First, I was there just kind of hanging out and it was busy all the time. Then later I started working there and then it just dropped off like drastically. Like we would have one customer a week compared to like, uh, you know, 20 customers a day just because 
there'd be nobody. Like all the Americans were gone. They sh they they were scared to travel. But what happened was those one or two customers that would come in would be awesome customers. They'd be like, I don't give a fuck. I'm traveling regardless of what anybody says. Now is the perfect time to travel because it was also pre 9-11. So people weren't getting, even though there was a Gulf War going on, it wasn't like the security had gone over the, through the roof. You know what I mean? Still people were carrying shit back. Like it was nothing. So anyway, it was a interesting time period. A lot, a lot of customers that came through them that were like, I wish I could go back in time and, and, and have those conversations again, because I probably was sitting across from some of the most epic growers because it was, it felt like everybody's the quality of the people that we got to hang out with. Cause we got to just, there was nothing else to do. It was just like, let's just sit here and smoke weed and talk shit. You know what I mean? We didn't have any customers rolling in. Whereas normally it was like, okay, thanks. See you later. You know, and maybe that was the best person in the world I should have been talking to, but I couldn't help it. Cause I was three people deep, uh, you know, sometimes when it was busy, you know, and, but this time period, it was like, you know, we weird, but it was interesting too. Cause it was just me and Alan sitting there and shooting the shit with these people. And that's when JJ came over, not JJ from top dog, but JJ from, uh, what's called, it's funny. He, his company is called advanced hydroponics, which is very confusing because everybody thinks of advanced nutrients. He's also a nutrient company based out of Holland. Right. So, but he, he, he escaped yeah. from C Seattle and came out there. He was part of that Northern light crew original okay. um and so people like that came and i think eagle bill came out there i don't know if you ever heard of eagle bill but he's quite a famous character in the scene in amsterdam back in the day he was uh another cannabis refugee like you know like many of them and it was it did people people kind of tended to go to Amsterdam before Vancouver because you mentioned you know cannabis refugees and there were there did seem to be a core that just kind of whoop, whoop, to boop, oh yeah you know? oh yeah. yeah oh yeah there's lots of them we had lots we had lots and lots of them and that, and the funny part was is it wasn't a very smart place to be because theoretically okay you are uh, in Europe but America has no problem extraditing people to America from America or to America from from Holland if now, this is the interesting part. If they will not get in more trouble than they would in Amsterdam. So luckily with cannabis, it kind of worked to their favor because theoretically you could always fall back on, hey, if I go back to America, I'm going to go to jail for the next 25 years or something. And there's no way that the Dutch would deport you on that, on those grounds. Now, they don't have a problem deporting people to America if it's a serious, like if you've murdered somebody, you definitely do not want to go to Amsterdam because they're much more extreme on things like that. But if it's cannabis related, you kind of had something of a of a story there. And like, so for instance, there's a guy named James Burnett, who is um, one of the only sort of, like he, he's the one who is behind the um, bed rocking. Have you ever heard of that strain? Uh oh no, I've not seen that one yet. There's a, there's a strain called Bedrockin, which is a Moroccan sort of hybrid, but it's basically what they use in legal cannabis in Europe right now. It's like the sort of baseline strain. It's not that good, but it's just one of the ones that got accepted and, and approved. Right. You know what I mean? So if you're going to go get cannabis from the doctor in Holland, it's probably going to be that strain, that's Bedrockin strain. Um, okay. but, that, but that guy, James Burnett, he was your classic cannabis refugee came to holland 93 i believe um we helped him out in the very beginning we had we, we uh you know we had a bunch of like uh fundraisers and we helped him kind of like adapt when he first got there uh, but he ended up pursuing being the first person to sign up to do medical cannabis in holland and when it actually happened they kind of like respected his timing of putting it in there because he put it in at the right time. so he put it in he was the first one to kind of step up and say i want to do this and they were like wow. sure and james is a super cool guy He's from kentucky originally i believe um nice. and uh but we had a bunch we had a we had another guy from kentucky who was out there who was a like he had they had shot it was like classic shot his dog and jump broke his back you know what i mean and like Jeez. he had like he had a couple <laughs> country song <laughs> It was a country song pretty much yeah he he um he had a yeah spot in kentucky he was your classic redhead you know super skinny 
really nervous in the service. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he came over there one time and I had a really crazy thing where I had, um, I, I invited him over to my house one time because I was like, you know, you need a break in life. I could tell he was like one of those guys who was just like so high strung because of what happened to him. You know what I mean? He hadn't had anybody yeah. be, no one had been nice to him for, and Holland is a rough place. Holland's one of those places. If you come there and it's like a, you know, if you have any kind of nervous energy about you, you're probably going to get ripped off because people there are very uh, much watching every tourist. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, this guy, right. he's, you know, and so if you're like all oh, nervous and the serve, he's probably going to, they're going to come after. So he, he had already, been through the ringer in the short time he had been there and so i uh i said yeah come on over i'll make you some mexican food we'll hang out smoke some weed or whatever and uh so he comes over and we got this little tiny apartment this is not the first place that i was at but my second apartment i had and uh it was in a neighborhood which is in the east of of amsterdam so it's kind of i don't know if you've ever been out to that brewery out there have you been to the brewery that's in the windmill no it's, uh, it's, it's probably called, not a Heineken, but no, no, it's called the Brewery, like so brewery, but Brewery with an I J at hmm. the end, and okay. it, it's called what's it called? The, oh yeah, it's the the I'll remember east. it, but it's 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 in the east of Amsterdam, and it's it's in a windmill. It's all you have to ask. You just ask anybody, okay. they'll say yes, uh, and it's amazing beer. Um, it's it's a killer spot. Like it's one of those ones where you go there in the afternoon on a, and you drink like one or two of their doubles or triples or whatever, and it's just like Thanks. okay, we are good. But anyway, so I bring them over <laughs> to my house and we're all chilling. Everything's cool, and I get a knock on the door and I'm like, huh, that's strange. And uh, didn't expect anybody, right? <laughs> I yeah, go to the door. Yeah. I go to the door and I open the door. Just a little crack, you know. And there's four guys standing out there, and they look kind of Dutch and. Dutch and normal-ish, you know what I mean? Not really anything crazy. You're not dressed in uniforms or anything like that. And then one of them pulls out a badge. He goes, Paluzzi. Oh, yeah. you know? And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> right? So I go, oh, you, you're you looking for the guy upstairs, right? Because the guy upstairs for me was like like notorious. Like he was always, there was always people coming up and down my stairs. He's dealing. Right. So he's a dealer up there. So I'm like, oh, no, you're looking for that guy. And they're like, no, 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 no. And they push their way in. Oh, no. And... Uh, they have a, they have paperwork for my spot. They're here to search my building. I'm like, oh no, this sucks, right? And so my friend turn around. My friend's like, he has lost every bit of color in his face. He's like, <laughs> he's already traumatized. Oh, he's having like a heart attack in front of me almost. And oh, then, no. and th and then they uh, they end up. Uh, we get busted. It was because of the guy upstairs because basically they were they were doing a huge one of those. You know when they do like 120 locations at the same time, yeah. And they come they come in at the exact same moment, yeah. So that nobody can con so they were doing like a huge heroin bust. Oh wow! And the, guy and the guy upstairs for me was part of that whole. You know they were looking. Thanks. They were and so they were watching my house, my apartment. And there's three three floors, right? So it's the Moroccan guy downstairs from me, me in the middle, and then this guy Jesse on the top floor. And so while they were watching for Jesse, unbeknownst to me, here I am like fucking stoner kid with my tie dye and my long hair <laughs> and I'm rolling up and I just came from my friend, the same guy, JJ's, he had a gross, so he had a little gross shop that he had opened up, advanced hydroponics. And I would go over to his place and I would fill up my jerry cans with with ro water and bring it home and feed my clones because the the city water there was shit right it was really bad so so i uh i, I he drops me off right with with the jerry cans and there's like a guy across the street i don't know this until after the fact but there's a guy across the street with like a tele telephoto lens and he's taking photos <laughs> and tourists and, you know, not even that. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I don't see him at all. Like, he's in some yeah. car. Who knows where he's at? But yeah, he's yeah. like, they 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 laid out these photos on my bed. Like, here's oh, a picture shit. of you. Oh, look, there's a, and like I see a picture of me. I see it, and and, and so right away I'm nervous because it's my fr my friend who has a big grow, and it's his car, and you can see the license plate right there. So it didn't doesn't take much, you know. And they're like, who yeah. is this? And I'm like, oh, he owns the grow shop, and 
So he gave me a ride back because I bought, I didn't, I, I couldn't carry him on my bike. You know, I was like, fucking, come on guys, <laughs> give me, give me a fucking break here. Right. But the thing is on the side of the jerry, cause they were nitric acid, jerry cans, old ones, you know? Exactly. So it has the picture of the, the corrosion, you know, uh, the logo diamond. Yeah. Yeah. The diamond with the hand with the acid eating in it, you know? So what oh, they're God. seeing is, Oh, he's got a lab up there, right? So they think I have a lab. Oh, shit. And so they're like poking me. All right, where's the lab? And where's this? Where's I'm like, what are you talking about, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking to myself like, oh fuck, these guys, this is, they're 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 up here somewhere, you know. And I'm I'm down at the I'm way down here on the totem pole. So, but they're they're trashing my place and they're looking through all my stuff. And this guy is freaking out that's with me. He's already like having, uh, he's got, and he's already got asthma. So he's on his inhaler, you know, he's like, rrr, rrr. Okay. and I'm like, oh my God. And so um, I had built a grow room in the back of my place. I'd taken the bedroom and cut the bedroom in half, put a wall up. And then I built like a, <laughs> we had like a bed built that was like a, a sliding bed that would go so that the whole room was a bed. And it was on casters, and so you could pull the whole uh, tray back. There was four six hundred watt lights in there, um, and I was making hash, right? So I had like all the hash screens, and I had trash bags full of stems, another bag full of trim, you know, of used sophisticated trim. Yeah, operation really. in their eyes. You know, they would be like, "This guy's doing sophisticated work here." Kind of. Well, what what I realized pretty quickly was that this was a high level drug task force guys these guys were not like okay. normal street cops they were like there okay. to bust to bust a huge lab because they came in the next guy that rolled in came in with a suitcase and he like <laughs> and he starts he's like oh i'm gonna test everything and i'm like go ahead like whatever you know what i mean like first thing they grab is the rooting hormone right they got some green powdered rooting hormone they grab that oh what is this <laughs> you know what i mean and i'm like it's uh for making plants right and, oh sure you know what i mean like so they're all like convinced that I got something going on up there. So they're testing and they're like, mm, nothing's happening, no reactions, nothing good. Um, so at a certain point I could tell they're getting a little disappointed there. Then they find some other stuff and they just keep testing things and nothing's really happening. But then the funny thing is, is I'm like, oh shit. And I go to get up and they're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And I'm like, I got to turn off the stove, right? And I had like, I was cooking Mexican food for this guy, right? So I had- Really? I had some, <laughs> I had, yeah, so I had beans on the, on the stove, which were, I could smell them, you know? So I was like, oh shit, I gotta go. And then the guys were like, whoa, back up, you know? And then like, it was like a Mexican standoff in my kitchen because I was about to turn off the stove and they wouldn't let me turn the stove <laughs> off. And I was like, I gotta turn the stove off. It's gonna burn. And they were like, no, no, we'll turn the stove off, right? So they turned the stove off. And then they looked at, this is the, this is the funniest part of the whole story is they look over and I got a bowl of blue corn chips, right? So I got like a big bowl of blue corn chips and they think I have a lab, right? So <laughs> they think I have a new drug, which looks like corn chips, <laughs> but I haven't quite broken it down yet into the blue flakes to get them into the baggies to get them on the street or whatever they were thinking. I don't know what they were thinking, but they were like, whoa, what is this? And I'm like, those are corn chips. And they were like, whoa, what's corn chip? Like they couldn't even wrap their heads around blue food, right? They were like, it's blue? I'm like, yeah, you said it's corn. I was like, yeah, it's blue corn. It's like, it's a fucking, it's like from, it's a normal thing. It's not a really crazy. And I went to eat one, I went to eat one. I go, I can eat one, look. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like they thought I was trying to commit suicide in front of them like, right. to, get out of it, to get out of this gigantic bus they were about to go down. But it was nothing. It was just so. It was so ironic that at a certain point they realized we got nothing here. You know, what I mean, they got like thirty grams. <laughs> they got like thirty grams of of hash, or maybe fifty grams of hash that came off of this, and a couple of little bits and pieces. The funny part was is that everything I had was really high quality, but not a lot of it. You know what I mean? Like I had really high quality hash, but only a little bit of it, and <clears throat> and every and I could tell that these guys were. 100% drug guys, like m maybe not like actively, but they, they were like appreciating the quality of everything that I did in the place. And so what they did was they took right. me back, they took us down to the station, which is at the Lides of Pine, Shoot. and uh, <clears throat> took us into, they, they took us to the like top floor, which has no cameras, 
no cells, <laughs> no nothing. It's just like a bunch of offices. <clears throat> and it's like, it felt like an office that they didn't use normally. And the cops were, and the cops just kind of like started asking me questions about how many times a day do I feed my plants and like what kind of nutrients was I running? And I was just like, wait a minute, is this an interrogation Learning. or a grow class? Like, what are you guys trying to figure out here? Because they were super impressed. They were like, well, we were, uh, yeah, we like how you built the table and, and, and you utilized your space really well. And I was just kind of like, this is really weird. Like I'm mean, getting the weirdest questions. And like the one guy like put his feet up and just started chilling and was hanging. Like it felt super like we we're just hanging out talking, it had nothing to do. And I was like getting like, first I'm really scared. Cause I'm like, I've only been there at that point. I'd probably been there for about a year and a half. So I was over my limit, you know, time limit, but I wasn't legal yet. So I was like, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to get deported. Right. So I'm thinking, well, what, what do I have to do? Do I have to go to court, you know, or, and then the one cop is like, so there's two cops. You had the classic, like good cop, bad cop going too, right. Where I had the good <laughs> cop who was asking me all these questions about growing. And I was like, Oh, this is, yeah, four times a day. Cause I'm on rock wool and I'm doing this and that. And I keep the pH at this level and I'm using this food that I get at this company from Sensi, blah, blah, you know? And so they're just kind of like, uh, and then there's another cop who like goes, I cut all your plants down with my Rambo knife. And he pulls out like some <laughs> big Rambo knife. Cause he's trying to be like the cool American guy, you know, like, I mean, right. like, yeah, he's trying to lick be, the blade. And, oh. Yeah. I fucking killed them all. You know what I mean? I was like, what well, makes you really tough? You know what I mean? I was like, whatever. And then, um, but then at the end, the guy goes, I go, so what do I have to do? do I, am I going to go to court or, and then the cop, it's funny because we're at the top of the stairs and he's about to let us out. And he's just like, Adam, you just have to go get yourself some new lights. And I was like, I love this guy. And I was like, this country rocks. You know what I, mean? and I was like, this is, this is great. So it was like a, a good introduction to the reality that I was not even in their wheelhouse. You know what I mean? They didn't give a fuck about me because I was just a guy growing weed. And they were really looking for heroin, looking for money, looking for human trafficking looking for anything that was like a guns guns especially like holland's very not into guns so as long as you don't have any of those things you're 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 not in their bad light at all you know what i mean like they're they're definitely especially then i think <clears throat> and then i think for a while it was okay but then at a certain point it got a little too much because every american that moved there had the same ambition which was to get an apartment grow weed sell it to the coffee shops which you know can be uh obviously it's 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 easy but it's also can be very uh uh looks really bad that the dutch can't even do it themselves you know what i mean it's like really so yeah, americans yeah. And, and and we were the ones who grew the best weed by far because we all cared the most because we had right moved moved across the world to go do what we like to do and we brought genetics with us you know what i mean for the most part most people did you know yeah so that's That'd where difference and they got jealous they're agricultural geniuses but that doesn't mean they can grow great cannabis yeah they because they they're more money fixated and they're more um volume fixated like their whole thing mm -hmm. is to grow more yeah. and bigger yeah. and you're just like whoa i mean i appreciate that but at the same time as we already know when you expand it too far you your quality goes down you know and and just no matter how you look at it whether it's uh you know, uh, even on a small grow, once you get above like 10 lights, there's, there's like going to be a lot of pockets that don't quite get what they could have got, you know, I, there, there is a magic, you know, scaling, regardless of whatever your business is, scaling is always the hardest part. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're in Colorado, I'm in Washington. We saw a lot of people learn that early on in the experiment uh or the legal system i call it the experiment the legal system that's going on yeah so yeah no sc scale it's it, well and also cannabis inherently has a um a uh kind of like problem child sort of syndrome where uh notoriously the the active ingredients are always kind of mobile they're not quite like fixed so right. no matter how you do it it kind of has this tendency to want to uh, release itself from the from the grips of, of corporate greed, you know, so like many a project has gotten fucked up by Terps uh, separating from their 
from the other part, you know, a lot of buttering situations, a lot of, you know, we're talking about flowers that might be perfect on Tuesday, but by next Thursday might not be so perfect or, you know, maybe not perfect until next Thursday, but you don't, you know, and there's always this like a lot of hands touching it, a lot of yeah. issues um, of, uh, depending on environmental issues, like here in Colorado, we have super dry conditions. Up in Washington, you have super wet conditions. So we have completely opposite problems, yeah. you know what I mean? So like we, we leave our weed out, it gets dry. You leave your weed out, it gets wet. Um, there's these like, yeah, these very regional things. And it's not like beer where you can just ship it across the country and yeah. someone can drink it and be like, that beer is this great. You know, it's like, yeah, it's the same beer. It might, might, you know, like, the Heineken's in Europe always, or the Heineken's from Europe always skunked, right? So when you got them mm -hmm. over here, they did not taste like the Heineken in Holland, right? You'd be like, what? Like Heineken in Holland is very like sweet almost. It's like a light sweet edge to it, right? And here it's like skunky and weird. You're like, that is bizarre. So it's a good analogy because we do get that with cannabis as well. What, you know, what was Amsterdam kind of the center as far as like what were people growing or what were people smoking? Because there were a lot less choices yeah. in the 90s than there are today. And did it seem like, you know, Amsterdam had its own thing and Rotterdam was on its own thing? Oh, for, for sure. Like, well, Amsterdam had the biggest tourist uh, factor. So they could get away mm -hmm. with probably the both directions like they could probably get away with selling the most crappy weed because they didn't have <laughs> yeah. as much repeat so the thing is when you had that repeat customer who came in every single day and dutch people are notoriously very uh vocal about issue like if they see a problem they'll they'll make sure to, to that is said it's mentioned you know so you can't really deviate from the formula too much right so you couldn't have like a different northern lights every day of the week but if you're in a really right. touristy location they could kind of get away with that so so Amsterdam had a lot of crappy shops that pretty much didn't care because they would have one they'd have one kind of weed and 20 things on the menu and they just pick and choose by the bud shape or color or you know what I mean or like oh the smalls we're going to sell them as this and the bigs will sell them as that and they'll be this you know, it's like and I watched it from behind the counter and be like yeah this is some scandalous bullshit right here you know what I mean it's like um and then you get shops that were more true to the game like homegrown fantasy was a good example that's a shop that actually that's why i liked them because they grew their own weed so they had like very specific things that were consistent you know and then you had other people who like for instance the very beginning it was mostly northern it was mostly well there was northern lights but who knows which one it was um there was um, a lot of skunk right which would be skunk one or the, what they had the strain called skunk 11 out there that a lot of uh, was a little more hairy a little more red hair than the problem with a lot of the dutch weed was it was very much a lot of red hair um because they somehow it seemed like they kind of focused on that in the beginning because there maybe maybe there wasn't as much of that when they had the hempy varieties that they were growing i don't know i'm not sure why but somebody there really focused on like red hairy stuff you know what i mean so that was it's almost like a it's almost like a porn analogy where like it was kind of like now it's all cue balled and looks all nice and frosty but back then it was just hairy as a motherfucker and in every direction popping out the, everywhere you're like what the um but there was a lot of um citral was a big big one when i was there okay. that was a that was a strain that was really big which again really red hair but kind of a flatter bud on that and a much shorter plant shiva shanti um was mm. another strain around there but that was also a little that was a, a little, sexy strain right yeah and it was a little woody you know what i mean i wasn't too impressed with it it was kind of like again a lot so i was there for the transition with sensi and the and the, the first things that they had were like they had uh, Shiva Shanti, they had the, the Shiva Shanti one, the Shiva Shanti two, the garlic bud, the purple ravi. They had a few, you know, the, the strains that they had were all kind of like Afghan heavy and not that mm -hmm. exciting. If you really looked at them, there wasn't very much variety. And then they took over Neville's and it just blew the doors off of everything that they had. So pretty much then the whole menu changed in 91 when they took over everything. And then that's, that's, that's really like when they, it's funny that's when they expanded and got really good but then it's also when they lost their way because 
it wasn't their formula, you know what I mean? So, right. yeah. yeah, because there were some, I mean, Black Domina, Four Way Maple Leaf, those are the first yeah. ones that come to my mind that people who had, had grown them then, which I don't fall into that category, but have grown them now, which I do fall into that category. They're just yeah. like, it's, it's not the same. I don't, yeah, I, I remember when Black Domina first came on the scene for them. Um, it's funny because there's certain things like they, like that and then the juicy fruit and a few other strains like that they all kind of came in while i was still working there um but it really wasn't like nothing compared to their to the nl5 haze and mm -hmm. afghan one and things like that that were kind of like the core uh the hawaiian indica ones those were all like their core kind of and the four-way was good four-way was definitely good it was just it needed selection you know what i mean so it was kind of it's a four-way so it's inherently got to have have a lot of different directions so that's 16 combinations if you just had if they were literally two different things each but they probably weren't there might have been much more you know what i mean so that there's right. you can go and multiply that <laughs> get a punnett square out start figuring out the combinations and you've got like 128 combinations possible right out of the gate you know so and then probably much more than that if you really broke it down, you know, and went forward with it. Two, two strains that I totally wanted to touch on too. And I have two of the ones that I have grown and of yours that I want to touch on too, but um, there's bubble gum and then white widow, like white widow, black widow for people who don't understand or recognize the difference. Were you, are you, do you know much of the story about maybe the split or how they kind of came to be two different things? Are they one thing? Are they different things? um not 100 percent sure because I, I i remember when the first when when white widow hit the scene it was a pretty big deal but the problem that that, that plant in had was it wasn't very stable right it was kind of like one of those yes. plants that it didn't really it was very hard to keep around as a mother plant it grew very tight nodes and things like that so it had that like it was one of those plants where it was kind of like if it was in the wrong hands, it, it went downhill real fast, you know? And so that kind of inherently made it uh, not last. Now the Black Widow split and all that stuff, I'm not 100% sure, but it was a lot of, I mean, the thing about it too, is you gotta remember Amsterdam was like one of those places that when something made a wave, it's like, it's not a very original town. It's kind of got that very much like, like when the, um, smart shop started right like that was around 96 or 7 something like that and by by 2000 there was like hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of these shops because everybody just like oh this is a winning formula let's do that um white widow was one of those strains that really got kind of eaten up really quickly and then grown there was like a group out there called the they, they they call so they kind of it was also renamed a lot of times too right so white widow um became known there was one one version of it which was called the, the planky the plank hmm. right and and it was because the guys who were doing it owned a flooring company you know so they oh, wow right they would use that as their code word oh the plank i bring over 10 plankies planky plank you know like t-shirts like if you're in the t-shirt industry all of a sudden you're moving a lot of t-shirts you know a lot of red i need more more of those green t-shirts the green ones you know um but in general it was uh it made a lot of waves i never really grew see i was one of the things about me over there was I purposely didn't grow a lot of strains that were popular around there just because I figured it was, did make sense because now I'm just like joining the ranks of all the, the plebs, right. you know what I mean? So like, I always really tried to focus on um, bringing back genetics from the States because my whole theory was that the testing grounds of the real, of the streets have already happened. Right. And so if something mm -hmm. rises up, through the ranks in the states it's got to be good no one's wasting their time whereas in holland there'd be people people growing stuff that i particularly would think right out of the gate would be like well that's a complete waste of time like why are you even doing that but because there there was a novelty behind it or because there just wasn't that um the the, the clientele wasn't this like in some small towns you would have the same five people at the bar every single day. Right. So, so they might grow better weed than the shops that were the average shops. You know what I mean? Cause the average shops yeah. were like, well, never see you again. So here's your Northern lights and it's bright, you know, it's like 
bright purple and got nothing to do with throwing the lights. And you're like, what is that? Um, it's got the and, name they came for, though. Exactly. So White Widow got abused really quickly out of the gate. Um, as far as Bubblegum, the best part about that is that I know the, I know at least my version of the history from front to back. What, um, what was interesting with that was that Victor, who brought the seeds over, um, who was the owner of the gray area, the original owner from the oh, gray okay. area. Um, so Victor brought those seeds over in uh, very the very first trip he came. So he he came in, and I was still working at Sensi, so I think it was around 91, mid, mid 91, something like that. So he brought the seeds over. I had him staying at my apartment, the same apartment we got busted at. Um, <laughs> And, uh, let's see. So the bust happened early. That was like right when he first moved. So basically he moved in, we built a room, we got busted. We waited around for a little longer. Then we just started the room back up again. <laughs> and, and because when we got busted the first time, it, we knew it wasn't for us. They were coming for the other guys. So when the guy told me to go get new lights, I was like, I'm getting new lights. You know what I mean? So I just, I felt like I had like the, the golden ticket at that point. Like I was told to go grow weed, you know what I mean? So I was like, I'm getting more. So that was, that was, uh, um, you know, I got off subject a little bit there. Oh, so bubblegum wise. So then, um, then we did. So the funny part was, is first I was growing, I, I think I was just growing stuff, uh, from, clone that i got from people from that used to yap the guy yap who owned, who was the main grower from uh homegrown fantasy he would he would give away clones all the time so i picked up some clones from him um those are the ones that got busted then victor had like 35 seeds that he had brought over or no 100 sorry 135 seeds that he had brought over um and they were labeled chewing gum right he had labeled them chewing gum and he told me he had been collecting them he basically was buying weed off of somebody this guy back in rhode island who he told me indiana right so i was like oh, okay so a guy from indiana that moved to rhode island that was growing this plant that he would pay 10 bucks per seed if you brought seeds back because he didn't because he occasionally it threw threw out a couple seeds and so victor was like fuck that i just kept them the whole time right and so he <laughs> he brought those and i was already working i had i was working at sensi so for me it was sort of like it didn't seem necessary it seemed like we needed we had so much to to look through and whatever but i was also getting a little bit of pushback from sensi as far as like it's because i was noticing that every time i grew something whether it was from them or not, they said it was from them. Like anything I grew, it didn't matter. I'd, be, I'd get clones. <laughs> I'd get clones from Yop and Homegrown Fan. Oh, we gave those to Yop ten years ago. You know, everything yeah. led back to them, and I really felt determined to not grow something from them. And so I started. So I spread those seeds, and what was funny was I was bringing in, like. After the first round that we did, I brought in, I had like the number one through the number seven that we kind of ended up with because we, we didn't grow all 135 out. We, we grew out like, I think about four, maybe 40, 40, 50 in the beginning. And then we had a bunch of males. We had a few duds. And so we ended up with these seven females, um, one through seven. And then we had a couple males too. Um, but we didn't really know. We didn't, we never even got to breed with those males. Um, but we, the, the number one through seven, what I did was, they weren't one through seven in the beginning. They were just a bunch of random things. But at the end, I was like, okay, this is what we're going to start with. The number one is the smallest. The number seven is the biggest. And that just made it easy for me as far as like my brain to get a wrap around. So we did the one through seven. And the one didn't have much structure, but a lot of resin. And it was very kind of leafy and dark green and very dark green on the leaf and very light green on the bud but kind of like sparse. And then the number seven was ridiculous. Like it was the biggest plant I've ever seen in my life. Like I was like, oh my God, like, but I have a picture, I had a picture of me where it was just like the bottom half of my face, but I'm holding the bud like a baby. 
and it's so big. I remember just being like, oh my wow. God. But then it dried out and it didn't have much, didn't have much to it. It was kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like, hey, you know, so it really was the, <laughs> the, the, the full spectrum going on of smallest and resiny as fuck, biggest and larfy. And then, and so um, the, the sort of famous moment, which changed everything and made it so like I knew exactly what I was doing was um, this friend of my, or a friend of, friend of a friend basically this friend of ours uh, gene who passed away recently his friend bucky was arriving at central station and he needed a, and he he was like hey could you go pick him up and we're like let's do it so go to pick him up and probably within like uh, a span of a few hours i get back to the house and my front door is open and I'm like, what? Well, you know, something, something's weird. You know, something's wrong. And I walk up the stairs, and my door has been lifted off the hinges completely. Like the door is leaning up against the wall, but my white, my door's wide open. Like I mean, I can see my bed. Like because I had moved. Because the way my house was, I had taken the bedroom and turned it into a grow. Moved my bedroom to the front, so when you walked in my front door, that was my bed right there. You know, what I mean, your classic grower house, right? And so. I get up to the top of the stairs and you can see my bed and my stuff and my pipe. So nothing has really been touched. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then I go in the back and it's like light, light bulbs are gone, which is weird. pH meter is gone. All my plants are killed. Like all my moms are dead, like gone, like gone. Like they cut them and took them. Like they didn't just cut them and leave them. So I couldn't even take a cut off of the plant or anything. It was just like cut, bagged and taken all my cl had two trays of clones gone ph meter gone and light bulbs gone i was like this is like the weirdest fucking sabotage situation i've ever seen because it's like somebody really wants to kick me in the nuts right here when it comes to yeah. this <laughs> particular plant so i was all tripped out but unbeknownst to them and what really saved my fucking whole deal with the bubble gum uh was that the number three which was kind of like the best one it could have been almost because it was on the smaller side but the resin really sort of like dissipated as it got higher up the scale so if you took the three or the four those were probably your best two you know what i mean to pick because anything below that was probably not yielding enough and anything above that was probably a little more larfy right and uh so there was like one little branch at the bottom that I just was like, oh, that probably will reveg, you know what I mean? And then that one, I got managed to reveg that one. And what I did was I took a cut of those and I gave and so at the time, um I got Tony the job from Sagar Mother Seeds. Well he wasn't Sagar Mother Seeds at the time. He was just Tony. But I got him a job at at the Hash Museum and Simon from Sirius Seeds also got a job not through me but through this other guy Johnny at the shop. And they so it was me, Tony, and Simon all working together at Sensi in ninety oh, wow. in ninety one, ninety two, and then it, and then in ninety three I opened up CIA, and then Tony and Simon started a company called Cerebral Seeds before either of them had either of their seed seed companies, and then Cerebral Seeds was when the Cali Mist came into fruition and. AK-47 also came into fruition, but then he started his own Sirius Seeds kind of like at the exact same moment. Like at that point in time, everything was codes. Like it was the S whatever, the S-17 or the S-24. Everything was an S because it was Simon. And, okay. and then it was Sirius later. And so, um, but I gave both of them a cut, right? So Tony made the bubble berry with his and Simon made his own version of the bubble gum because he used a different male, he went more sativa and I was gone and I stick to a more indica version. Um, but it was interesting because like when I gave Tony that bubble gum, he was working with DJ short. So we had DJ shorts, original, uh, original, uh, blueberry male. So he, Damn, he had, okay. so he had his, he had the, the, he had his, all his working materials for Europe because him and him and uh, Tony were making a deal together, which all fell apart right later. But Tony basically had like 
oh, look at this. I'll take your bubble gum and I will mix it with his blueberry and I will make bubble berry. And bubble berry by far was the best thing that he ever produced over the years as far as in-house that didn't come from somebody else's work that, well, they did, but it didn't come from like someone didn't just hand him the seeds. Um, right. And it was amazing. And Bubblegum for me is still one of my best sellers and Bubblegum I'm sure for Serious Seeds is probably still one of his best sellers. So it made a huge impact. And the part of the story, which I think is interesting is, was a, is that first of all, it was chewing gum. It was not bubble gum, right? It was called chewing gum because of the texture, not because of the smell. And the fact that it had a sort of sweet side to it was was beneficial but it wasn't the backbone of the naming of it the naming of it was about the texture and the fact that it never dried like it stayed kind of moist and wet all the time especially in amsterdam because oh. amsterdam, oh. amsterdam yeah. doesn't yeah. and so but not well i say especially in amsterdam but it wasn't named in amsterdam it was called chewing gum in rhode island because victor he owned a bar called the church house inn which was a, like a punk rock bar across cool. from the civic center right and so it was also a hotel, right? So they had a hotel nice. with a, with a club, and then they had, you know, like uh, HR was there, just living there uh, for a while. All the punk bands would come there and play, but then they would just stay there and then go do their little mini tours around New England or whatever. And his mom, so it was basically run by Victor and his mom and his two brothers and his two brothers, Eric and Dave, all three, like Eric, Dave, and Victor all we're in hockey teams together, right? They all played hockey. So you <laughs> yeah, can imagine exactly. already, like, you can already imagine they own a bar. Well, what happens around one o'clock in the morning every night when you got three guys who are like hockey dudes, you know what I mean? They're like, let's clear the bar Drop out. the gloves. <laughs> yep. You know? Drop so the they, gloves. So they had like this crazy place, but what he would do is stick the weed under the bar and he would um, wait for somebody to mention how great it smelled. And then he would do the, he would do the old thing we would do back in the day, which we thought was genius, but I'm sure it had zero validity to it. Which we'd say, "Hey, are you a cop? Because if you're a cop, you have to tell me you're a cop." And if they didn't tell you they were a cop, and then they busted yeah. you, you're like, "Dude, I asked. I broke yeah. the law now, right? I don't think that ever had any validity to it. I think we just made they're that allowed up. to lie to you, <laughs> just oh, for your reference. Allowed yeah. to lie to you, one hundred percent." allowed to lie for sure so it was one of those situations where uh yeah he brought those seeds um we did this so we started to do the selection we got well it was even okay before he before i got broken into he uh, victor uh busted his tooth while putting in a drip line right he's trying to you know wrestle a drip line or something and popped out a tooth and then realized that he had no insurance uh, in Europe, so he flew back to America. While he was in America is when I did the initial selection of those of the the, the seeds. So I had grown out the first forty or whatever, like forty or fifty, I can't remember. But and then I was doing the selection, and when Victor came back, I think he came back like a couple days before we got broken into, um, and. Uh, it was kind of like very bizarre because the timing was like, like we had people who wanted the bubble gum really bad. They kept asking us for it. People were offering him like 10,000 guilders at the time, like 5,000 bucks, but they were like Dutch gangsters. You know what I mean? So then what would happen? You know what I mean? It was gonna So, so in a way, the gold you know, or the bullet, you, you can, it, you can it, take the gold yeah. or you can take the lead. Which one do you it, want? <laughs> Cause we're getting that plant. <laughs> Exactly. So I, I don't, I have never, and what really pissed me off is that after the fact, I didn't sell bubblegum seeds on purpose because I thought, well, if I sell bubblegum seeds then everyone's going to be growing bubblegum and then it's going to make it harder for me to find out who stole my bubblegum. Right. So I, I, my genius idea was to just kick back and wait for the see who started putting that out. And then I would, you know, I would figure it out. But then of course, Simon started selling seeds almost as fast as he could. And I was like, dude, and, he, and his excuse was that I wasn't selling seeds. Well, you're not selling the seeds, so I thought I could do it. And I was just like, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not doing it for a reason. And I, I'm not doing it not because I don't want to. I'm trying to like crack the code of who broke, who stole my bubble gum. You know what I mean? 
but yeah, so it was kind of a, a bittersweet one because I lost a lot of potential sales, obviously, but I also never really figured out what happened there exactly. I kind of lost a lot of faith within the industry because it really showed me the the ugly side of it all too, where you're like, oh shit, you know what I mean? Like there's people out there that'll just come in and steal it if you don't pay attention and take care of it, you know? So, but I also got to see the hype and how the hype train goes because everybody who smoked that weed back in the day, especially in Amsterdam, was like walking out, scratching their head like they've never even, and all it really was was just good weed. It was nothing, right. like I said, it wasn't that it was, oh my God, this tastes like bubble gum. It was like, this weed is fucking good. And the key to it, and what I really loved about it was that when you smoked it, and you left and you came back, it still smelled like the weed was in the room. Like it never left the room. Like it had that heavy, heavy lingering kind of maybe a feel, heavy feel or something sulfur because it was skunky, but in a different way. It was more of the, the deep, the deep indica funk that you don't see very often because maybe it exposed itself or something. I'm not sure why, but it's just definitely, uh, uh hard to find those things occasionally they pop up here and there it's like when you do stem rubs and you're like what wait a minute that could be the one right there but then it yeah. it doesn't always come out in the in the wash you know yeah i totally i definitely one of my the, my keepers the westport grape juice uh veg it has this like just smoky campfire smell to it like it smells in mm -hmm. veg nowhere in the finished flower so, yeah. but it, it, it's easily to, for me to pick which one it is, uh, right. based off in that. veg, in veg. Yep. Yep. Yeah. In yeah. Veg. yeah. It's, one, luckily, of those, it's, of it's one of those strange, well, it's one of those strange though, too. Like what was also interesting about it was that when Victor had told me in the beginning was that he had a guy from Indiana who had moved to Rhode Island and was growing this plant. So I was like, okay. So I put that into the description back around 2000 and I think I've, I think I originally offered around like in, in any kind of volume, I think not until around 99 or 2000, maybe a little earlier, but, um, but when I did that and I wrote the description, I said, um, bubble gum, uh, traveled its way to the Netherlands via new England from Indiana. Right. So fast forward a year or two later, Rob Clark's um, friends from Indiana are in town staying at his place. They come over to my spot. They're like, give me a big hug and say, you know, Adam, I want to thank you for putting Indiana on the map. And I was like, hey, no problem. Uh, because he had never heard of bubble gum in his life. You know what I mean? And I was like, oh, really? Okay. Because I was told us from Indiana. He's like, well, I don't know, but now everybody wants bubble gum. So thanks a lot. You know what I mean? So you basically like kind of confirmed to me at that point, but I still hadn't really put two and two together. And then um, Victor and I lost touch with each other. He left in, he left Amsterdam in 95 and I didn't link up with him until around 2000 and nine or something like that maybe eight so there's a big gap like a 15 year gap or something there <clears throat> and so when i finally hanging out again and, and the funny part is, is i met him in a at a supermarket in rhode island when i was there for a funeral and i just happened to like hey i'm leaving i'm going back to amsterdam i better grab some some uh tortillas because you can't get them in Amsterdam. so i, I, went, <laughs> in, awesome. I, I went in to grab some tortillas and as i'm walking down the aisle i was like Victor like holy shit what are you doing here anyway that's that's another story right that's another whole story in itself but um yeah so Victor uh so so Victor uh told me at that point after we're sitting down having a smoke hanging at his place and I'm talking about Indiana and he's like oh it's from Illinois the guy's from Illinois not Indiana and I was like wait a minute are you, are you sure because I've been telling everybody Indiana for so long. It's now a it's it's now its own thing. You got Indiana bubblegum right. is now a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what I would be curious to see, and anybody who listens to this who's from Indiana or knows somebody, because it's one of those like I have a really hard time where I I I, I and I do this with a lot of things. Like I'll discover something, right? Like a new 
something, even, even brands, right. I'll, I'll, I'll find a brand. I'll, I'll hype them up while there's still, nobody knows about them. And then the minute that they blow up, nobody will remember the fact that I was like, dude, I was doing that already fucking two years ago. What are you talking about? And so it was kind of the same, uh, there too, where it was like, you know, the, the, uh, yeah, I lost my I lost a little track there. <laughs> but, but no, in that's, that's, yeah, but in general, it was one of those things where it was like a, a little ahead of the game, you know what I mean? As usual, once again, uh, too too early to to the to the to the mix there. But in general, I think also the the name Bubblegum, like I could not get it legally. Like I have a trademark on on MK Ultra. I've got trademarks on. I've got trademarks on things you would not expect you to be able to have a trade. Like okay, MK Ultra is a acid experiment from the CIA, yeah. but yet they gave me that as a trademark, no problem. But then when I tried to trademark bubblegum, they said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Probably because they want the search results to distract from them. They're like, yeah, it's... Well, it's well they, said, they said that it was too general. You know, bubblegum is too general, right? Oh, I know what the point oh. was. Is the point. My point was is that I'm sure out there there's a thousand people who probably use the word bubblegum before me because it's very descriptive. It's like, Hey, this tastes like right. bubblegum. Right. So <laughs> I'm never, I'm never saying that I'm the one who's sort of like invented the word bubblegum for cannabis, but as far as selling seeds to the public and getting it out to the world, it was definitely that time period. And what I would like to see is somebody, uh, to find me a pre 93 bubblegum, from Indiana, like somebody in Indiana who was growing, I was growing bubble gum in 86. And it was because I'd, I'd, I'd be humbled if that was the case. But up until this point, I kind of think that I, I do feel like I've created this myth by mistake, by putting it out there, when I put it out there, very much like very much like like um, Dave Watson fucked up skunk mm. by calling his skunk number one, skunk number one, where he should have called it sweet skunk, number one or you know anything descriptive that would have made you go that's not so skunky it's a little sweet you know what i mean like and that's what it yeah. is whereas now the problem is we have a lot of like we're chasing the skunk dream right we're all looking for it but the problem was it got really like everybody got fucked up by the signage that dave put up he put the you know skunk to the left when it really was skunk to the right and everybody followed the left path and we're all following this sweet skunk thing. And then you get like, there's, you know, when it's growing, yeah, there's some skunky vibes, but mm -hmm. the minute you harvest it, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't taste any skunk in there. I just taste yeah. fucking some sort of sweet, nice, pleasant flavor, which I believe, you know, like the skunk one is, is quite nice. It makes really good hash and it's a big, beautiful plant to grow, but it's not skunky. You know what I mean? And that's fucked up. So kind of like similar in the sense that I put out the wrong information, but I didn't do it on purpose. He kind of did it on purpose. So it's a little, it's a little more scandalous. You know, he was like, I don't give a fuck. Skunk was very, very popular at the time though, as far as the, the idea of skunk weed, because as we all know, there was skunky weed, even skunkier than what you got nowadays. Mm -hmm before there was skunk number one, you know what I mean? Like when there was yeah. just that, it was just out there. But it, but again, it probably put itself out of business, you know, because of the fact that it was uh, so skunky. It smells, and you know, we're hoping that, we're hoping that somebody out there has it, but yeah, as many people have hunted and not everybody can find it. And, you know, as, as far as like the bubble gum too, it's, you uh -huh. know, it, it's unfortunate that that happened with your selections kind of getting taken. And I understand the like, let's see who puts it out. Cause I can identify it. And then everything went wrong, but luckily you're not a one hit wonder. Like there's, there's a lot more in your catalog. Um, you know, the two, two that I'm looking at right here. And so Sage and Sour, now that started with the Sage. Um, sure. so let's, what is the acronym? Sativa. Afghani genetic uh, equilibrium. Okay. Um, now, how did how did that turn into a, a sage and sour? What was it that's about sage that turned you on when you found it? And was this in Amsterdam? Yeah. So sage is its own little storyline. Basically, my friend Mojave, um, 
who is Rob Clark's partner now with agronomics. Um, so, so Mo was my, as I, when I was growing up, he was my sort of connection to the cannabis world because he was in born in big Sur, you know, Santa Cruz area. His brother was a grower. His brother's about eight, I think maybe eight or eight years older than him or so. So it was just like that perfect kind of age gap where we got the, we got the, the growers brothers and they lived up in Partington Ridge, which was like right above Esalen. And it's kind of like, you know, pretty magical spot. They grew fireweed. Um, so I always had the kind of like that, that gave me the, that always gave me the, the, the kind of, the edge like you could say and when i first so mo's the guy that i called when i got to amsterdam and realized it was real you know i called mo <laughs> i said make sure you bring seeds with you so he brought seeds and the seeds that we selected those from were i mean they didn't have a name right nothing had names at the time and big sir holy was kind of like the selling if it got to santa cruz that's what they'd call everything that was grown in the region you know what i mean it was all big. So, so you had like the sativa version and the indica version and different people growing them at different times but we just had the the rating system like triple a double a you know so i just said to mo just just bring the triple a don't even waste your time with anything else just bring the best of the best and so he brought those he kind of similar to what with me where he, he was already there for a year before we ever even decided to go through them um what was interesting with there is that he grew the entire, like he did most of his selection outdoors, which is kind of rough in Holland because they don't have the greatest uh, conditions. And not only that, but we're talking like outdoors in a backyard, in a in a place that might get six hours of sun a day. The rest of it was kind of like indirect or him moving plants around to kind of achieve maximum uh, sun. But we, and then he had this tiny little shed in the back and in that shed, he had, I think, maybe four, 600 watts in there. And he did pretty much all the selection there. And him and I would do sessions and we'd sit there and try to, you know, figure out, uh, basically at the beginning, it was figuring out uh, if there's something worthy in there. And what we kept going back to was this one that had like a sagey quality to it. You know what I mean? We kept calling, oh, that's a sagey one. This one's like sage, man, this, thing, this thing's really sagey. And the interesting part about the sage of that is that Big Sur is, is all white sage growing everywhere, right? So so for both of us, we had this like, huh, this tastes like Big Sur right here. Like this actually tastes like the ground in Big Sur. Like we could feel like it, which, which, which was very cool because both of us, you know, we're here in Holland that's it's the same skunk uh citra northern light haze combos kind of just recirculating around and around we get this like eucalyptus-y kind of sagey sort of vibe of what the fuck is that that's really weird and then the, so the funny part was is that uh mo had that moment like you know when you're falling asleep and like right before you fall asleep there's like this whole like super creative moment where you're 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 just like a lot of times you'll get that flash right then and there like bam i gotta do this a lot of times i love it too because i was just thinking about it earlier where like at night i know exactly what i gotta do the next day but the next day i have no clue what the fuck i'm supposed to be doing <laughs> like like but that night yeah, like right right before bit. i go to bed you're like okay so tomorrow i gotta do this that that and this and that and then the next day you're like ah, i'm putting that off definitely not doing that until whenever you know <laughs> but somehow at night i knew exactly what i was supposed to do um, but anyway he had that moment where he calls me up and says grab a pen and i grabbed a pen and he's like write this down sativa afghani genetic equilibrium i'll call you tomorrow <laughs> hangs up and then the next day he's like you wrote that down right and i'm like yep got it right here and he's like good he's like that's that's what we're going to call it. We're going to call it SAGE, but that'll be the acronym. And it just basically means like a 50-50 sativa indica hybrid that's perfectly balanced, right? And then Rob Clark, who is now his partner at the time, tells us, boys, I think you've described all of the greatest modern weed in one one acronym you know what i mean so i was like oh there you go well thanks rob so anytime rob yeah. said we did something good we felt like we did something good like rob rob approved you know what i mean yeah. um and uh the cool part about sage so we had we ended up on this one called the s6 right so we had a, we had a bunch of different phenos of it the s6 had the most wasn't the so 
the thing about sage is it's not the strongest weed in the world, but it's like the most pleasant. Like it has a certain, especially like in couples and stuff like that. Like you get like a couple and they smoke sage together and it's like everybody's happy. You know what I mean? Whereas if you smoke OG, the guy might be happy, but he's not really like happy and fun. He's just happy and stoned. The, yeah, the yeah. girlfriend or the wife is like, you're so lame. But <laughs> when they, when he, even if she's not smoking, if he's smoking sage, she's like, oh, the house smells great. Like she likes it and she's pleasant and he's happy and he's not a douche because he's not sitting over there being all like playing fucking Madden or whatever. And that's kind of where it, it was a very creative high. Also, a lot of times people would smoke sage and then they like fix stuff or play music or, you know what I mean? They, whereas, so that also didn't piss off the, the other half or whatever, you know what I mean? So it was very much like a, I noticed along the way, it was a lot of couples liked it. A lot of musicians liked it. A lot of DJs liked it. Like all my friends who were musicians were like, and writers. So this is the other one that was really interesting. We had a guy, I wish I could remember his name, but there was a guy and he was, um, uh, quite a successful um uh speech he do speeches but he did like um uh support kind of like kind motivational of... speaker yeah, yeah ex exactly like a motivational speaker the funny part was he could not do it without sage so i was like so so you're telling me the motivational speaker guy cannot get motivated unless he's got some sage he's like yep I got to have it to get motivated to do my motivational speeches. I was like, Oh, there you go. That's what I like to hear right there. It's a, you know, and then you got like, uh, Marcus Aurelia, right. Who he, he, he's, uh, his band was named Sage. He came to Amsterdam, bought some seeds from me, came home, his favorite weed. He's a musician. He loved to smoke it. He named his band Sage, right? I got couples. I had a couple one time who, came to Amsterdam, bought seeds and bought a jacket off of me, right? And bought one of my hoodlums. Uh, they put the seeds in that they put, they, they, you know, they, cause the whole thing about my jackets, they had a lot of secret pockets and stuff like that. Right. So they went out one time, I think, I don't know. They were in, I think they were in like new England, maybe in Vermont or something like that. And they left the house and it was during a snowstorm, right? They ran out of gas in the middle of a snowstorm. Like Shit. the worst thing, the worst thing you could ever do pretty much. Right. Especially when you're like, you're with your girl. Now you're in it. <laughs> it's your fault. Right. You're an idiot. Yeah. Why didn't you put yeah. gas in the car? You fucking dumbass. Like, ah, all that. Right. So yeah. it's getting all heated. It's not looking too good. They both are wearing hoodlums. Right. And also inside the hoodlums, it's got papers, right. It's got a place for your papers, like a paper dispenser built in secret pocket built in. So they start thinking about, well, fuck, we're kind of stuck here. We're not going anywhere. We better figure out something. So they start looking through their jet. Oh, wait, I got papers. Oh, I got some weed in a little secret pocket. Cool. Well, that's already making everything a lot better, right? Then they figured out what's cool about it was back then, this is like in the very beginning when we first made the jackets, we didn't do separate zippers for the men's and the ladies. We had the same zippers that we used on okay. both. Uh, later, we changed it up where we had different zipper pulls. Like, so the ladies had the lighter zipper and the men's had the chunkier zipper. But at the beginning, we just had the same one. So what they did was they took their two jackets and they zipped them together like a like a sleeping bag. So now they have, so now they got this big blanket, right? So they're like, okay, we're getting really high. We got a blanket. The fighting has stopped. They get down and fucking end up, she ends up getting pregnant, right? <laughs> So, so they named the kid Sage because they were smoking Sage and with the hoodlums on in the car, you know what I mean? They came back and told me the whole story later. And I was just like, well, that's fucking awesome right there. You know, that's like, that's like extra bonus right there. But in general, Sage has that kind of like, it's a very much a, um, and I, and I, and I see it all the time. People put, what's your favorite weed of all time? There'll be like a hundred people say, oh, gee. 50 people say sour and 30 people say fucking granddaddy perps and one or two people say sage, but they're always there. 
and those people and then and then what happens is somebody else goes yes yeah, sage i forgot about that one that's fucking oh dude i had a story right. back in the day because it's one of those <laughs> things where it really is um a unique um sort of set of terps see terpenoline which is what jack ruined is what <laughs> is what is what sage is 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 predominantly sort of has right so it has a lot of terpenoline some beta caryophylline but a lot and a bit of pinene but that that terp ter, so terpenoline which gets a bad rap because it got it's very dominant in jack and jack kind of ruined a, like a ton of different strains out there where it just like dominated 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 like oh my god so the jack terps which are terpenoline so like for instance train wreck which was super popular then yeah, yeah. Then Jack kind of took over that lane, that terpenoline lane, you know what I mean? And then less people grew. The, and also the whole thing about train wreck is it's it's quick, but it's a big sloppy, you know what I mean? It's a floppy fucking pain in the ass to it's grow. Okay. To trim it's to trim, it's like, oh my God, nobody wants to trim it. It's I like fucking, smoking it. <laughs> everyone loves smoking it. The the benefactor is that it, it is quick. But the trimming part, the reason it's called train wreck is because it looks like a train wreck every time you open your door to your like, oh, no. you look inside, you look inside and you're like, oh my God, dude, look at that. Like, it's just like, everything is just in discombobulated and you got to like pull them apart and shit like that. So, so in general, uh, but, but if you think about it, like what terpene deserves the word terp in the fucking name right it's got to be the best terpene it's got to be the best terp of all terps right <laughs> you can't be called terpenoline and be a shitty like yeah it tastes like poop you know it's like no 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 we have that that's scatol that's scatol <laughs> which smells like poop right we have we have a poop terp we have a poop terp we have a vomit terp we have all those terps they're out there but when it comes to the cannabis terp that would probably be the most exciting one of all time it should probably be terpenoline right so so when you hit it right it's right whoa that's fucking nice and the funny part about it which is really weird is that when we launched the sage which um was around 98 i think officially when we put it out like to the world you know we'd already been fucking around with it for a few years but we didn't really put it out in seed form for a while because it was kind of like a it just it's it, anything haze related in any way shape or form or anything with those kind of like complicated turp profiles they're very hit and miss so in the beginning we were getting so we waited until we had already gotten to about the third generation of growing them out before we were like felt ready to release them because what happened was you would you'd only see it pop up here and there it wouldn't be very dominant you know what i mean and and the but what's interesting is that we really like, like I had Neville, Neville came over to my place one time with, uh, with Steve Dumac around 2000, maybe, I guess. I'm not sure. hundred um, percent. 99. Oh, maybe around 99, actually. It's probably around 99. And, um, because he wanted to try the sage, you know? So I was like, oh, okay, cool. cool. And I busted out, of, busted out of bud, smoked it with him. The thing about Neville is anybody who's ever met him has realized he's he's kind of a cunt, right? He's like he's one of those people who just like, eh, like not nothing's like never not, happy, not very much so, right? Right? And so, buddy, but he liked it. He and he first thing he asked me is if he could have a cut of it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> um, so what do you got? Like we got something. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to give you anything, you know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> well, then why the hell would I give it to you? You're like, it makes no sense. Like, of course I'm not going to give it to him. And, so that was my only time I ever got to meet him officially. Like I've been in the same oh, wow. room with him. I've been in the same room with him, but we never really talked. And then that was the one time I felt like, okay, he's in my space. We're going to smoke my weed. And it was really cool. But he, and he gave it props, but his only props were that he wanted it himself. It didn't give it any more like, oh, this, this, is. it was just more like, can I have this? So I guess right. that's good. You know, to me, that means you like it, right? He wouldn't say, can I have this if he didn't want it? But, um, but it wasn't like I ever pursued it and I didn't really want to hand over the fucking golden ticket at the time. Um, but yeah, yeah in, gen in general, I think that we were lucky because a lot of people hadn't, for some reason, that that terpenoline heavy thing had not popped off there because Neville's Haze is not terpenoline heavy. It's totally different. It's got like a, it's, 
it's got terpenoline in it, but it's not the front end of everything. It's like a much more of a kind of exotic musky Nam Champa kind of vibe thing going on where you're just yeah. like, Whoa, this is exotic. It's even more exotic in my opinion. Whereas the Sage had more of a electric kind of, euca- like I was saying before, like kind of a somewhere between eucalyptus and Sage pop and if cali mist was the only thing that kind of came close you know what i mean back in the day where i had that kind of like whoa what the fuck is that that's unique um but in general that for some reason that that particular profile had not been really exposed in in holland yet on all the other hazes were you know the other hazes were kind of rinsed out so it had a little moment in time um and also it was funny was because it was so unique people who knew me if I walked into like a club or something, the DJ would already know that I'm there and he'd be looking for me and I'd finally get there. He'd be like, dude, I knew I could smell you when you yeah. walked in. I knew exactly, I knew it was you. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, here I am, there it is, Sage guy coming through. And then my other friends who would always get Sage from me had the same exact thing. Like they're like, dude, now everybody says it to me. Every time I go somewhere, hey, you smell like that. Cause it just had a particular uh note to it that wasn't really mm-hmm. around even though you know should have been there's a lot of enough weed around so you know sometimes it's just the magic combination the you know the percentages and i you know i absolutely agree they, again only having smoked the sage not having grown it but having yeah. grown and smoked a lot of the sage and sour like it is unique there's almost artists that you know like share madonna they, they only yeah. need one name but you also or Eminem, like you, you hear the fast like well, that, white dude rapper, you're like, yeah, you compare him to somebody. Yeah, versus I was like lucky, it's like them. I was lucky with the sage and sour because I wasn't pushing the sour. Sour is really hard to nail, right? Yeah. And sage is really hard to nail. So if you have them together, you have this sort of open palette now where you, you get a more unique vibe. So we get like there's a whole bunch of different unique phenos of sage and sour out there like i have there's one here in colorado which is a complete outlier because it's purple and it's it's chunk it's chunky purple wacky like it just i'm like (laughs) wow where the fuck did this come from like the selection is is from jared jared from um from five eight selected it so it's been around it makes really good extracts um again doesn't have either of the characteristics of the sage or the sour diesel so it's like but yet on its own merit it's a fucking whole new thing and then i've got other ones which are much more in the vein of of for instance a a a sage with some sour notes or the other way around a sour with some sage notes there's there's versions of that out there but yet there is like the same as this this one outlier that of this uh purple sage and sour out here it's similar with the mk ultra there's a purple outlier that pops up every so often in the in the mk ultra mix and almost guaranteed every single time if the person selected it and held on to it it was their end all of end alls yeah because it just is it is like that 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 fucking interesting like um i know duke's always talking about it because he's like you got that purple you know because he's seen it and it just pops up you know what i mean and it's like um you know i never bred for like i i really don't want to go down and do line work uh because i've never had the same location long enough i have now but the problem is that i don't have the plant count now you know what i mean like i don't Mm -hmm. have the if i have the if i have this location with the plant count then i can do the line work to make things go exactly where i want it what i've been trying to do is more or less isolate things and keep them within a within the corral so that when i have a chance and i can actually bust out you know a hundred plus seeds of each type and really put them through because that's the whole problem is we're not doing anything i mean occasionally here and there i'll get some testing done but for the most part i don't really do scientific breeding because i don't have the money to do it at home and i'm also not the last thing i want to do is hand over to somebody else yeah. <laughs> stuff so i've been kind of like yeah. just sitting on lots of work and one day i'm gonna get around i'm literally that guy who picks up the thing off the side of the road and says well you know <laughs> one day i'm gonna use that and maybe 12 years down the road i'm like 
holy shit, that fit just perfect, you know. But I do love that. For me, that's actually the the one of the best feelings ever is when you're building a grow or you're doing something along those lines or you're, you know, you're coming up with some concept and you can just within arm's reach grab something and then grab something else and then somehow do the monkey thing about oh look ooh, fits, I mean, fits fits like a glove you know what i mean and then to me those <laughs> those are those like special golden moments within growing that are awesome you know what i mean like yeah i feel i feel good you know and that's definitely being in amsterdam and then you know the pre-legal markets you really had to make do with what you could have and what you can find um, oh yeah i think i told you about the scrap of ponics back in the day right yeah, yeah so, <laughs> same, episode same one concept. guys Exactly. Yes. Scrap of Onyx, episode one. Check it out. Same yes, idea. It's all out. about Absolutely. it's all about ingenuity and um, and with growing in general. Like what's funny is we're just trying to do really simple things, right? We're not even trying to do anything complicated. We're trying to get like water to go from A to B and get through down to <laughs> like it isn't even that complicated. Right. But then you can make it complicated. You know what I mean? I've seen grows where you're just like, holy shit, dude! Like, is that a strong? Is that a tent? You know, like, yeah, it's just like, no, that's a spaceship right there. Um, you're, cool. you're lucky. Yeah, you're lucky, too, with the, um, you know, experience that you've had. You're able to kind of spot some of the winners, even if you're only doing like 10 or 20 at the moment versus 100 or 500. Mm -hmm. If you have that one in 100 pop out, your palate's probably going to be able to detect it and at least keep furthering that. Uh, you know, I would imagine. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm, I've always, I've always had uh, pretty good success. I mean, there's been plenty that have slipped through the cracks, and there's sometimes dead ends. A lot of dead ends. I mean, there's been a lot of breeding projects that I thought were going to be awesome, and then just not. You know what I mean? Which is, which, yeah. but at the same time, and then I've had other times where it's just been like, oh my god, you just everything that this thing touches turns to gold, which is great, but you'll also find that um, the ones that have the longest longevity are are usually uh, the p biggest pain in the asses from day one. Like, you're like, really? Are you fucking yeah. kidding me right now? Like, it's very hard to get the combination of the plant that's a grower's plant and a smoker's plant, you know what I mean? And a, and a bean pusher's plant because the one that, that yields the best is definitely not going to be the one that smokes the best. It's definitely not going to be the one that you know, it's like grows the best. And you're just like, fuck. So getting those combos is what it's all about. And, um, you know, that's, that's the fun too. That's why I always tell everybody, like, even if you're growing from clone, throw a couple seeds out there each time, just because it's, it's the luck of the draw. You know what I mean? Like we're never going to know until you plant it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been rad. I know we're kind of getting up to the, to the time zone yeah. here. And well, we can do a part three. Cause you know, my story, I hope end. so. They, they never end. I'm, I'm ready to talk much further. What you could do if you want is uh, maybe, and if anybody's listening to this show and they've listened to part one and they've listened to part two, because what I'm now figuring out is that it's harder in my brain. Cause I'm like, wait a minute, did I tell this already or not? Like, I don't even know. So I don't want to double up on everything, but if you guys uh, have, have potential uh, side sidelines of the stories that I've already told, because that's um, a lot of those can go down rabbit holes further. Um, I'm down to, uh, to go deeper on any of those and of course if there's anything out there beyond those stories that we have not touched on um it'd be cool that you contact chad send him that way that way you got a whole list of like hey i've got 20 things that they want to know now because you've already started you've dug so many little mini holes we want to dig deeper you know what i mean and go 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 deeper into those little mini holes because i tend to i i, I did the uh the the jug dealers podcast and now my brain is like wait a minute did i say that on that show or did i say it on that show because i think there's definitely been a few crossovers where i've told two two sides of the same story which is always fun you know because i'm trying to keep them so that if you watch all my things you're not like he tells the same story on every freaking show but i'm trying not to
No, you do. You were a genius today. Actually, you didn't repeat any stories, which is awesome. We covered completely <laughs> different things because, you know, I listened back to the first interview. Big sure. fan. Uh, so, again, thank you for making the time. And, yeah, there were the bubblegum question came from, uh, you know, a viewer last time. Guys, hit me up, whether it's through the awesome. comments or through the DMs. Um, I know well, and I, and, and, uh, and Hoodland is on- another thing. Perfect. Yeah, I'm glad I could touch on both of those. The good thing about the uh, the other part of the bubblegum story, if the person, whoever it was that contacted you, wanted to know, there is a episode from about four years ago uh, on the show where it's um, the return of the bubblegum, and Bucky, who is the guy that was I went to pick up at the air, at the train station, is the same guy who oh, I yeah, gave okay. him. So I gave him a cut before he went back to America totally forgot about it ran into him at canacon <laughs> and so at canacon this guy comes up to me and says hey do you want your um do you want your bubble gum back and i was just like what are you talking about and he's like yeah you gave it to me and i was like i don't remember ever giving my bubble gum to anybody in america like i was very specific about not giving it out after the fact because um and i and he said yeah because i was there the day you figured out that the, like your room got broken into and when you Revenged it. I asked you if I should could take a cut back to America, and I was just like, "Wow, this is blowing my mind." So he gave me back my original cut twenty plus years later, and when I grew it out the first time, it outperformed everything in my room. Where I was just like, "Wow!" And and, and the craziest part too was it had been so long that I really lost complete like what I thought it was was it was it grew better than i thought it did but it also was that the profile was like once again terpenally and heavy and i was all the fuck is going on here did i get jack did it turn into jack or something like it was <laughs> it was like a sickly sweet overripe banana is what it ended up smelling like which mm. never i'd never had those terps in that i remembered in the past right and so i was a little bit confused and then the second time I grew it out, what, it, what was interesting then is I, I made some seeds from it. I grew those seeds out. And when I grew those seeds out, I got like a total deja vu flashback thing of the pre-selection of the bubble gum when I was doing the one through seven. So it, it was like weird. Like I was like, whoa, dude, I just had the taste of the thing that I threw away. Like it was in there. You know what I mean? So there's like... It, it's interesting to see because there's definitely, um, you know, if you're not with a plant for 20 plus years, you might have these ideas. It showed me quickly, like, what you remember is not necessarily what might, you know, mm-hmm. be there. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And so it was definitely like, uh, oh, and the other cool part was, is that I was also wondering how the Oregon Kids Banana OG, which was made with the bubblegum had such banana terps. I was like, that's weird. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. I smoked my bubble gum for the first time in 20 plus years. And I got banana terps. Like what the fuck is going on here? That's weird. So I think it might've just been there all along. And I never knew, you know, I never, I never got to explore it that deep. So yeah, there you go. It out. Well, Talk cool, about exploring. You. We'll explore next time, deeper, deeper, more on the Chad Westport show. Yeah, Heck yeah, yeah. Mr. And uh, thank you very much, guys. Keep, yep. uh, yeah. Keep we'll, we'll have you on. We'll have you come up. Well, yeah, we're gonna have you come over soon, anyway. On, on okay. we'll, we'll pick we'll pick a good show. Have you come on when there's the right combo. One, two, one, four.